All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We want to welcome our, our in-person audience here and, and certainly work, welcome our uh, web audience as well. We're, for those of you in our, our in-person audience, if you didn't realize it, we're live streaming now until 4 o'clock. So welcome, welcome, everyone. We've got a, a very special program to share with you today. Uh, now, typically in our amphitheater hot shop, what you do tend to see is traditional furnace style glass blowing. So we've got big furnaces and, and big reheating furnaces sort of tucked into the back wall of the studio here. But when we opened this facility back in 2015, we built it with the intention of being able to make all sorts of different glass objects in here. We wanted to build a space where any artist or designer in glass could come in here and make whatever they could potentially imagine. So we equipped this place as best we could. And uh, we will often bring in guest artists to work with us to really sort of show uh, our guests the, the leading edge of what's going on in glass making. And this week we have one of those programs going on. So we have four guest artists who have joined us this week. Uh, to my right side here is Dina Kalahar. And Dina, I'm gonna give you everybody's Instagram handles as well. It's a great way to sort of look up their work and, and follow along with their work. So Dina goes by Soulfire Glass on Instagram. That's S-O-L-F-I-R-E Glass on Instagram. She's visiting from Las Vegas, Nevada. And Dina is particularly skilled with figurative forms. Uh, particularly female forms. Her, her figures tend to be very expressive and uh, sort of very, very gentle and uh, have a very feminine energy to them. And she is making a, a beautiful figure that is going to be the centerpiece of the, the work that these guys are doing here. So you're going to see Dina doing some figurative work. You're going to see her uh, doing some other elements of, of sculpting that are going to be applied to the finished piece. Uh, next to Dina, we have Shayla Berman. And Shayla goes by Windstar Glass on Instagram, W-I-N-D-S-T-A-R Glass on Instagram. She's visiting from Colorado Springs, Colorado. And Shayla is particularly well known for her pattern work. She does brilliant, beautiful pattern work. And uh, she has been making some elements that are sort of a faux stained glass that will be part of this overall object. Now, I guess I should uh, let you know what the overall object is going to be. These guys are working on a theme of a cathedral, a sort of a Gothic cathedral. And within that cathedral, we will have Dina's female figure as a centerpiece in there. And uh, we've also got some stained glass elements that will go into that cathedral. We've got some gargoyles that will be interacting with that female figure. And uh, so Shayla has been producing the stained glass parts and I'll, I'll bring those to the camera as we continue through the, the course of our presentation here. But the next artist I want to introduce you to is James Lynch. James goes by Hick Dog on Instagram, H-I-C-D-O-G-G. -G. And James is visiting us from Phoenix, Arizona. James, also an excellent sculptor, and uh, he's also really skilled at putting compositional work together. So taking multiple elements, getting them attached into a really cohesive finished composition. And you're gonna see some of that expertise come into play pretty early on in our, our stream here. Uh, one of the first big moves of, or one of the first biggest moves of the piece is gonna happen in just a, a couple of minutes here. So we'll, we'll see James really sort of directing a lot of that uh, construction of, of the composition. And next to James over here, we have Jose Sanchez. Jose is visiting us from Los Angeles, California. He goes by Saiyan Glass on Instagram, which is S-A-I-Y-A-N-G-L-A-S-S. -S. And uh, Jose is also a brilliant figurative sculptor. But he and Dina have very different styles and, and very different voices to the sculptural work they do. 
Jose's work tends to play uh, a lot more off of pop culture, uh, a lot of uh, anime-inspired figures, a lot of video game-inspired figures. His work tends to be really bold and have some sort of aggressive forms and, and, and textures to it. So Jose has been plugging away all week making these brilliant gargoyles that will be interacting uh, with our figure. So these guys have been here with us uh, since Monday. Uh, Jose, James, and, and Shayla got into town uh, Sunday night and started working Monday morning. Dina joined us. Uh, she flew in Monday night, so we got her started Tuesday morning. And they have been plugging away all day, each day, working towards this one object. And they will continue working uh, right through the day tomorrow as well. So they've got plenty of time to make a very elaborate piece. They'll probably have close to 200 hours worth of work in uh, just this single, single object here. So this is a great way for us to really highlight some of the, the most innovative work that's happening in the, the field of glass and particularly in the field of flame working. And another thing I should point out, I mentioned this piece is a cathedral. I've mentioned all the, the different sort of conceptual elements that will come to play in here. This piece will also function as a water pipe. Now, these guys are some of the, the leading artists in the pipe making community of the, the flame working scene. And uh, they all were just, actually all of us were just out at a trade show, uh, one of the biggest events of the year for them to show and, and sell their work and were very gracious to very quickly clean up their booths at the trade show and, and get out here to Corning to, uh, to be part of our program this week. So we really appreciate them putting the effort in and sharing their talents with us here in Corning. So some things about process. Uh, these guys are using the flame working technique. It's sort of a, a style of glass blowing where rather than using big furnaces as heat sources, they're using torches. The torches are running on propane and oxygen. And when they mix those gases fully, these torches are capable of getting up over 4,000 Fahrenheit. So while they're working, those flames are running anywhere from about 3,000 to, 3, to maybe 42 to 4,400 Fahrenheit. Sounds like a pretty uncomfortable environment to work in, but with all the oxygen that runs through the torches, it helps to focus that heat pretty well. So the heat stays pretty well contained within the flame, and it's also getting pushed away from them. So it's a lot more comfortable than it, it would tend to sound from just hearing the temperatures. Another thing that tends to surprise folks if they haven't seen flame working before, the way we handle the glass. The fact they're holding the same piece of glass that they're melting and holding it with a bare hand, just a couple inches away from where it's molten. Well, glass is a really poor conductor of temperature. So it simply won't conduct the heat to where their hands are. And they also really need their dexterity. So the idea of wearing gloves doesn't work all that well. You just don't have the control that you need. So thankfully, we really don't need gloves for most of what we do as, as flame workers. So these guys are getting some of the, the elements done. Jose is working on uh, another of his gargoyles here. And the gargoyles, several of them represent different emotions. And the idea is that Dina's figure is interacting and, and dealing with the different emotions that, that may come up in life. So Jose has been using his, his really bold, figurative sculpting style to make some really brilliant, uh, brilliant gargoyles. James right now is working on a sculptural element. Uh, he makes a, a lot of work that references Southwest themes and, and also uh, sort of uh, archeological themes. He's making uh, a bone sort of on the end of this form that he's got here. So a lot of his work references skeletons that you might find in, in desert uh, scenes. And so working on sort of a bone element that, that will go into this. Jose has been attaching uh, some of the smaller gargoyles to these bone forms. These will form arches uh, as part of the cathedral form as well. So getting more of the parts together here. Dina is making some more decorative elements to, to enhance the, the overall piece as well. And I can see James and Shayla are getting ready for a big move here. So glass 
as it's heated, expands or swells a little bit. As it cools, it shrinks or contracts a little bit. So if a piece of glass gets heated or cooled too unevenly, different areas expand and contract so differently they pull apart and they crack. We call that thermal shock. So they are always concerned with the temperature of the piece and how drastically they're changing the temperature of the piece. That being such a big concern, we use these ovens. So they, we've got a big oven behind James and Shayla here. We have another oven over next to Jose. We use those ovens to keep the parts warm or to soak be, heat gently back into them. The flames I mentioned are getting up around 4,000 Fahrenheit. The ovens are holding at 1,060 Fahrenheit. That's hot enough, they can take the glass directly from the oven and put it right in the 4,000 degree flame without any thermal shock, without any cracking. But at 1,060, the glass doesn't soften. It's not gonna change shape at all. So that allows them to know the piece is staying safe. They'll take it out of the oven quickly to make attachments and quickly get it back into the oven, let the gentle heat soak back in there. Once it's soaked back in, they can take the piece back out and make more additions to it. So the, the pacing here is different than uh, a lot of the, the glass making demonstrations you're gonna see us present here at the museum. There are many slow times, and then as the piece comes out of the oven, as it's about to right now, things get pretty intense for a few minutes. So Shayla is grabbing Dina's figure. And the first big move here is getting that figure attached to the, the center of the, uh, of the cathedral. And as James pulls the cathedral out of the oven, you'll notice at the bottom there is a big wide hollow form and that is the can that's gonna sort of hold uh, most of the water for the, the water pipe. So that's that wider part at the base. Dina's figure is gonna sit right on top of that and the function will run right through her figure. So it'll come up through her tush and actually out through her right elbow. And all of the elements that are attached onto the form that James has right now are hollow. They're, they're all intended to be part of the function. So the, the water and, and smoke will flow through the elbow and then the water will drain back down through the arches. The smoke will come up through the, the top of the piece and it will operate as, as what we refer to as a recycler. All right, so here comes the attachment. Now, as we're making attachments like this, there are a couple of big concerns. We wanna make sure both pieces are hot enough that the glass fuses, so it fuses properly. If it's not hot enough, it may stick for a while, but then separate as it cools. Another important thing about the attachments is that the wall thickness stays nice and uniform. The tendency as you make an attachment is the seam gets thicker than the rest of the piece, but we want uniform wall thicknesses. Glass is strongest if the wall thicknesses are uniform. So they've made the basic attachment between the figure and the base. They wanna refine that attachment. Before they refine that attachment, they want the figure braced in from another, another direction. So it'll be nice and stable. So you can see where Shayla is making this attachment. This is called bridging. So attaching uh, two, two sections of what will be removed from the piece later. So those elements are held in place and then they'll be able to go back and refine that seal where the figure meets the, the can. Now, James and Shayla have collaborated a number of times through the years. They're very familiar with each other's working styles. They communicate very effectively through some very intense times. Uh, they have also made a fair bit of work with Dina through the years. And Jose has never worked with the three of these folks here. So they've been sort of developing their, their communication and uh, really talking their way through all the different steps. It is really difficult to, to collaborate with other artists. 
Uh, not only is it difficult to get techniques to match up, but you have to manage your, your expectations. You have to have a, a, a very high degree of respect and trust for one another, for both your ideas and your, your technical abilities. So there's a lot that goes into collaborating. It's a lot more than just being good glass makers. You really have to be able to connect uh, as, as humans as well, to, to be able to get along through the process and, and uh, really good collaborations. Everybody seems to gain something from their collaborators. And that has very much been the, the case through this week. So they're refining that attachment where the figure's meeting the can and notice We've got this big Bunsen burner here as well. They want to make sure this piece is staying warm. They've been out of the oven for a couple of minutes already. The Bunsen burner provides a gentle heat to keep things safe so they get a little more working time out of the kiln. And using these hand torches here to refine that seal, get the wall thickness as nice and uniform through there so it's going to be a really strong structure. And it is hollow through there. Uh, again, the, the water and, and smoke will come through that tube, uh, tubulation, that attachment there. So getting that attachment all set first, making sure she's positioned just right. And these guys have done several checks of lining one piece up with the other long before making this attachment. The next major attachment, after they've got the, the female figure all worked in there, one of Jose's gargoyles will be attached towards the top of the piece. So they had to make sure to leave enough space between the female form and the cathedral so they can still get the other gargoyle in there. All right, so that first connection, yeah, good stuff. Glass making and especially uh, glass making in, in this sort of format here, it's a lot like jazz. It's uh, very, very spontaneous and uh, things sort of flow at, at different paces throughout and uh, also like a jazz show, if you feel like those artists uh, deserve a, a little bit of your appreciation, uh, applause at any time is appreciated as well. So feel free to jump in there. So Jose's uh, refining this gargoyle here. Uh, removing the rest of the clear glass. We, we often use clear glass as handles to hold on to hot elements so that we can grab onto the cold clear glass and make attachments. And uh, once we've made the attachment, we want to get the rest of the clear glass off of there. So he was just picking that off. And now we've got this. Which uh, emotion does this gargoyle represent? Uh, laziness, or sloth. <laughs> laziness or sloth. Nice. <laughs> All right. So to tell you a little bit about the glass that they're using, it's a very specific composition of glass and it is really important to the objects that they're making and also the process that they're using to make it. It's what's known as borosilicate glass. A lot of folks don't realize it, but there are really thousands of recipes for glass out there in the world. And as you adjust ingredients in a glass recipe, you wind up with different characteristics to the glass. And what's most notable about the borosilicate glass is the fact that it tolerates temperature change a lot better than most other glasses. I, I mentioned earlier how glass expands with heat and contracts with cooling, and that makes glass sensitive to temperature change. It will tend to crack if you change the temperature too quickly. Well, with the addition of boron oxide to the glass, it does not expand and contract as much as most other glasses. So it tolerates temperature changes much better. And that uh, really makes this an ideal glass for this sort of, uh, of sculpting and also for a finished object that is going to have some heat applied to it. So it's an ideal form. I see we have a question from our web audience. What do we got? How long has each artist been melting? How long has each artist been melting for? Dina, how long have you been at this? A little over 25 years. A little over 25 years for Dina. Shayla? 10 years for Shayla. James, how many years have you been blowing glass? 26. 26 for James. Jose, how many years for you? About 13 years. 13 years for Jose. So we've got a, a pretty broad spectrum here. And uh, all incredibly talented artists. Shayla, I can't believe you've just been at this 10 years. 
That's, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Congratulations, you've gotten off to a very fast start. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So we've got brilliant artists. They're all flame workers. They do some similar things for finished objects and that they're largely uh, focused on, on making pipes. But as you can see, very different styles and very different voices to their work. And they are doing a great job of really taking advantage of the expertise of each of those sort of niche uh, styles to create a, a beautiful finished piece here. So Shayla's just scooping a, a piece of her faux stained glass out of the oven. To tell you a little bit about the process for making the stained glass, and maybe we can show a piece on the, the camera here. Try to sneak in here. So we have a few different pieces she's been working on. So this is one section here, one window. And I'll put a, a piece of white paper behind so you can see the color probably a little bit better that way. To create these, Shayla starts with a piece of hollow tubing, a hollow clear glass tube. She draws on the outside of the tube with stringers, so very thin threads of colored glass. She'll draw, we've got some of her stringers on the bench top, here's a piece of hollow tubing. She'll draw a pattern on the outside of the tube. Once the pattern is finished and it's uh, been fully fused in, she will cut the tube lengthwise and then she opens the tube up. And the idea is to get to that image on the inside of the tube. So you get uh, an image that has a layer of clear glass over it, so it protects the, the color work that's behind it. It will have a nice shine to it as well. So she cuts the tube open and lays the tube as flat as possible with the torch and, and by pressing it flat with some hand tools. From there, she adds uh, another layer to the process. So. Yeah, when she finishes flattening things just by, by hand, it gets fairly flat. But as you might be able to see, we've got some different reflections going on here because it's not perfectly flat. So all the different little ripples and angles on that piece of glass affect the, the way it reflects and, and transmits. So to get things perfectly flat, she showed us a, a new technique that we hadn't really seen around here before. And I, I think we've coined a, a new term for it. So she then takes this piece and will put it in a little ceramic crucible. That crucible then goes in a microwave oven. And after about 20 minutes in the microwave oven, the borosilica glass slumps completely flat and is a nice, crisp, flat form. From there, she cold works the glass. So she'll take it to a lapidary wheel to carve it to just the form that she wants. And uh, from there, it is left with a sort of a, a rough surface. It's not perfectly polished at that point. So now she's polishing with the flame to get it completely back to that real glassy, sort of shiny look. So uh, I think what we have determined for the name for this process is popcorning. Uh, as Shayla was headed downstairs, we've got the microwave downstairs below our, our studio here, and uh, she was headed down to, to pull another piece out of the oven. I asked her if the popcorn was ready, and James started suggesting, well, there's our name for the technique. So there you go, internet. It's called popcorning. All right. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so Shayla is just using this hand torch, and by heating the glass a little bit more, getting it just up to the molten state, it polishes. It'll have a, a nice shiny surface to it there. We love that we've defined a new process here. All right, so our live streams here at the museum. Uh, we will live stream for a couple of hours uh, until four o'clock today. But these guys aren't gonna be finished with the piece at four o'clock. Uh, we will probably be here well into the evening tonight. They are gonna work all day tomorrow. I suspect we'll be here pretty late tomorrow night as well. These guys are some serious workhorses. We've gone later and later uh, each night so far this week and I suspect that pattern is, is gonna continue. So you're not gonna see the finished piece today. 
But with our live streams, in about a week or two weeks, we'll put a recording of the live stream back up on the YouTube channel, and at the end of that recording, we'll have some still images and some video of the finished piece. So by all means, come back to our YouTube channel in a week and a half to two weeks, and you'll have a chance to see the finished piece. So good, good opportunity there. And also, again, I, I highly suggest checking out their, their Instagram pages. You'll see some brilliant work there and uh, they're, they're quite good about updating their, their social media presences, so very fun to follow. So this is sort of the, the calm in between the, the storms here. These guys are working on the, the objects that are, are gonna be attached to the bigger form, creating all the different details. And uh, then we'll, we'll get in, once the, the piece is warmed for a few more minutes, we'll get into another big attachment. And I believe the next big move that's gonna be made, uh, those of you who are, are up and coming flame workers are really gonna wanna catch. Uh, some of you have heard the term a Jesus seal. And uh, it's a really unique way of attaching two pieces of tubing together. Uh, in very tight spaces. So this will be a, a good opportunity for, for folks to learn a little bit more about a really, really high-tech move that can be a very important instrument in your, your arsenal as a, as a craftsperson. So we'll, we'll see that move in a few minutes. Uh, once that is done, she's, she'll be using the Jesus seal to attach the elbow of the female form to the backside of, of the arch. So that'll be an important move, and then we'll get into attaching Jose's uh, bigger hollow gargoyle to the top of the form. And as they get those major attachments, once the, the gargoyle is on there, that will be the, the full function of the piece will, will have been established. And from there, it's a matter of more attachments, of more embellishment, and getting the stained glass panels in there. So many more steps to go. Yeah, James just said it's a lot of hurry up and wait, and that is, that is sort of the nature of, of this beast here. And there is no rushing. If you try to rush the glass, it will fight back, and it can fight back in pretty dramatic and, and, and uh, disappointing ways. So maybe we can show you uh, some other elements of Jose's sculpting here. I'm going to sneak around you and grab this gargoyle head and this hand that are so brilliant. So, maybe we could sneak in here, show some of the details that Jose creates. Really brilliant sculptor. And flame working is an ideal process for this sort of detail work. Uh, since we have so much control over where the flame hits the glass and also where it doesn't hit the glass. It lends itself to just this super fine detail. I love the texture that he uses. Uh, he introduced us to some new texture tools that are really brilliant that he has uh, sort of designed and developed himself. So brilliant to, to see this level of sculpting. And this, uh, this sort of work, Flame working is probably the only way you're really going to get that, that sort of detail and uh, be able to make a composition this way. And there are uh, a number of different processes we can use to shape glass. They all have different advantages and, and different challenges to them. And really the biggest advantage to flame working is that control over detail, that control of where the heat hits the glass, where it doesn't hit the glass. The biggest challenge for flame working in my mind is, is probably scale or at least volume. Trying to make really big, thick, heavy objects with just a torch, very difficult. There, there are other processes that would tend to make that work a bit more manageable. But when it comes to the fine detail stuff, the, the torch is an ideal tool. All right. So we've got some polishing done on our, our first stained glass window there. James is working on another one of the, the bone sections that will sort of adorn the, the outer perimeter of the base of the form. And Dina continuing to work on some nice highlights that will help to decorate the rest of the form here as well. We pressed Dina pretty hard to get that figure done. 
And uh, because the figure is such an important part of the function of the piece, it was important that she have that done by this point so we can get that figure in there. Then we can start to work around that. So the, the order of process, really important with this work. Uh, it's been, been fun watching these guys connect on this piece. A lot of, a lot of mutual respect going on here and uh, I think everybody learning from each other as well. I know I've been learning a ton here. It's one of my favorite things about bringing guest artists in. Not only are, are guest artists great for us to, to illustrate what's going on in the, the broader glass world to our audiences here, but also as in-house artists here at the museum, we learn a lot from, from bringing other folks in here. So we've been learning some new techniques. These guys have had some good suggestions for new equipment for us to add to our, our shop here as well. So we all grow quite a bit by interacting with each other and, and uh, interacting with, with other artists in the field. Looks like we've got a leafy element coming along here. That'll tie in nicely to some of the, the decoration that Dina has on her figure. It has uh, sort of some tattoo effects. She's drawn some, some flora and fauna all around the body as, as interesting tattoo details. So uh, another thing that we have going on around this program tonight, after we finish with the live stream from 5.30 to 7.30, we have uh, what we call Winter Collective, which is a, a retail event. So we'll be setting up finished works from uh, these artists here, and also our friend Sibeli is going to have some beautiful work in our, our Winter Collective. And uh, so 5.30 to 7.30 tonight, uh, we'll, we'll tear these guys away from the torches for a couple of hours and uh, we look forward to, to a little meet and greet with the artists and also they have a bunch of work available for purchase in our retail shops. So great opportunity to, to chat with these guys and also see uh, a lot of their beautiful finished work and, and hopefully take something home as well. And we appreciate these guys saving some work to bring here too. I mentioned they were at a, a major trade show before getting here and their, their work is highly desired and uh, their, their booths seem to be very busy throughout the entire show. So we appreciate you hanging on to some work to bring it here. So James getting some rods ready here for handles. Oh, we have a question over here. Yes. Where will this completed piece end up? Excellent question. Well, we have made arrangements for the shops to have first right of refusal. So it very well might wind up uh, being for sale in, in the shops here. Uh, if that does not work, then the artists themselves will, will take the piece and uh, find a collector for it too. So yeah, it, uh, it will be potentially available for purchase through our shops here. Yeah. That's a, a fairly new thing for us. We're, we're doing a, a nice job of really incorporating all of our different departments here at the museum into our, our public programming, which really, uh, really is giving us a, a bit more power with, with all that we do. It's great. Nice to be able to have some finished work from our artists here for people to, to see and, and potentially purchase. I've been really enjoying seeing some of their, their finished work. I had seen a lot of it online through, through the years and to actually see it in person, it's, uh, it's amazing how poorly things are represented online and, and how much more effect they seem to have on you in person. So yeah, for those of you, uh, if you wanna come out and, and visit with us tonight, if you can, we do ask that you RSVP online. So if you go to shops.cmog.org, uh, right on the, the homepage there, there is a, a link where you can click and, and RSVP and, and come and join us tonight. And again, these guys are gonna be here working all day tomorrow as well. So if you're maybe around the region right now and you wanna come in and see some of the live action tomorrow, by all means, come and see us. And uh, what we typically ask our guest artists is that they commit to working from at least 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. when they're here. So we know that 
we're going to have them available for our, our guests to watch. Uh, but we offer up additional time if they want to work uh, later or, or even start earlier. And so Monday, and these guys worked until 6, Tuesday till 8, <laughs> last night we were here till a little after 10, and uh, yeah, I'll be surprised if we get out of here before 10 the next two nights also, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how it goes. There, uh, as I mentioned, there's no rushing this sort of work, so you've got to wait for the piece to soak properly in the oven before you start to mess with it again. Uh, if you rush that piece, bad things can happen pretty quickly, so we're, we're not going to put them in that situation. So it looks like we're getting ready for uh, another one of those moves. I think this is going to be a, a setup to get Shayla working on that Jesus seal that I mentioned, which was uh, a phrase that I heard coined by Micah Evans, super talented flameworking artist. And uh, I, I know it the seal had been around before that. Other, other people have certainly achieved it, but uh, he seemed to recognize this amazing thing that happened. It blew his mind, seemed miraculous, and uh, hence, hence the name. And it's, it's interesting, though. The pipe-making community very much has their, their own language, and uh, some of it connects to the more standard language that we use in the glass community, a lot of it is, is uh, entirely new terminology to me. I, I, I'm trying to keep up as best I can, but uh, it's another thing I count on guest artists for to, to keep me tuned into the different terms. All right, so here's our piece. Just soaking some heat in there with the Bunsen. And while the piece does warm up to 1,060 in the oven, a little additional heat before you start working on it just to really soak some extra heat in is smart with the Bunsen. And they've got this brilliant setup here on the, on the bench. There's a, a hole in this platform here, so their handle tube slides right down through the hole, allows it to sit stable right on a, a flat surface here, and then they can work uh, around the piece here. So Shayla has a blow hose in her mouth that is connected to the bottom of the, that handle tube. She is heating the two different surfaces and blowing very gently, which is pushing a little blister out one way, a little blister out from the, the other section, and eventually she'll get those little blisters to touch but at that point, there's still a membrane between the two. So we've got a, a surface that needs to be broken. She'll continue to heat and blow gently, heat, blow gently, and eventually that membrane between the two blisters that connected, the membrane will break, and you'll be left with a hollow tube running between the two sections. Pretty tricky technique, but the the possibilities and the sort of the, the, the form potential that it unlocks is, is really helpful. It's like walking on water, James says. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tricky seal, but when you get the hang of it, it is a really helpful one. It's tricky when you're, you're trying to make attachments in multiple spots on a piece, especially when they're hollow attachments. So this is a, a technique that has become a more and more common thing in, in the pipe world. They're, they're often connecting multiple tubes from different directions, and learning this technique is a really helpful one. And uh, James mentioned earlier this week he's done a couple of these. Shayla has a lot more experience with the Jesus seal, so we're going to leave it to her on a on such an important connection and such an important piece here. Not something you want to be experimenting with on, on this sort of a, a format. So using the, the hand torches to get enough heat in there and then puffing a little bit, stretching it, watching for when that membrane breaks. And once that membrane separates, then they'll continue to just, just smoothen the seal. I spoke earlier about how we want uniform wall thicknesses throughout the entire hollow form. So this is part of getting that uh, 
that wall thickness uniform as well. We also got to talking about working on these elaborate pieces and, and knowing the, the sort of risk that is, that is possible as you're working on something so elaborate with so many hours in it. Uh, James mentioned, you know, if you're not if you're not really shaking with with energy by the end of a, a piece like this, then you're just not going at it hard enough. So uh, I, I agree that you get this sort of adrenaline going as you're making your your big moves with a, a piece like this. You know, there's potential for things to to maybe go wrong. You really have to focus, and that uh, that sort of energy drives you into even even deeper focus. And uh, the, the sense of satisfaction when you pull it off is just that much greater as well. So working their way through there. They've got the Bunsen flame on there as well, trying to keep everything else warm and safe. But they will not apply their torches anywhere else to that piece. At this point, other areas of the piece have been cooling a bit. They don't want to hit it with the 4,000 degree flames anywhere else on that object, just where they've been maintaining heat and, and working that seal. I love this, how the function is gonna run right, right through her midsection and out that elbow, down that arch piece. These guys have put an awful lot of thought into design and function, and, and without all that thought, you do not get to this level. These guys are excellent communicators, too. I've been so impressed with how they communicate very directly and definitively. All right, back in the oven, jazz show. Yeah, not bad, not bad, guys. All right, take a breath. <laughs> yes? What do they have wrapped around the, the joint that's in there? Uh, I don't know that, oh, there, there is a piece of graphite tape between the, the joint and the punty that's sort of holding the, the joint in there. Yeah, so they've, they've got, the, the joint is on, on the back of the piece. The joint is a connection uh, where we can make a cold connection with uh, a, a, a banger or a bucket that will be attached to that and that is where your consumables will go. Uh, so we want to hold that in place so it doesn't shift at all as they're making other moves. So we've got another piece of tubing that fits perfectly into that joint, and that is connected to other parts of the rest of the sculpture. It's bridged into place, so that all is going to hold that joint, keep it from moving while they're working on it. And there is a piece of graphite tape between the, the punty that is stuck into the joint and the joint itself. The risk with those two pieces of glass in there and the heat going on around it is that they could fuse and get stuck there. So that bit of graphite tape will keep them from fusing so they'll be able to remove it safely later. Yeah. So I've, I'm learning a lot through this too. I, my, I've, I'm a flame worker, I've been at this 28 years myself, but I do not tend to make this this type of work with, with uh, function being so important and all these these different sort of connections of, of different things so I'm, I'm learning a ton too. Uh, James asked me uh, at the beginning of the week if I had any graphite tape and we have a lot of things around here we have so many different tools but I don't use graphite tape so we, we didn't have any and luckily had just enough for uh, for that joint to, to work out. All right, so now we're, we're back to the, the calm part of things. And uh, the piece is gonna soak in the oven for a little bit. Jose continuing to work on another gargoyle here. James is creating more and more of these bones that are gonna decorate around the, the base of the form. And I think the next big move, once the piece soaks for another 10 minutes or so, is gonna be to attach a, a hollow gargoyle onto the top of it. 
So the Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And then we'll start putting on the, um, the side horns that, or the side bones that have his gargoyles mounted on the side. Ah, okay. So that'll be in another like, Gotcha. Okay, so they're they're adjusting process as we go here, which is which is important. The, the gargoyle on top is not the next move. They're going to save that for a little later in the process uh, to limit risk. The the longer some of those uh, more more difficult and more decorated objects are are on the piece, the more risk there there is. So they're sort of figuring out the the, the lowest risk approach here. Very smart. Yeah, risk mitigation is, is the name of the game here. So their, their next moves are going to be attaching some of these bone pieces and, and filling out more of the arches to the cathedral. And some of those bone pieces, Jose has been attaching some of the smaller gargoyles to. So that is coming along. And so we'll start to see more of the, the decor and more of that form getting built out further and further. A little more design discussion, figuring out process here. That is uh, another big part of the process. There have been a lot of design sessions on the whiteboard. There have been a lot of discussions of next steps in process, uh, a lot of discussions on uh, what elements still need to be created and, and where those are gonna be positioned on the piece. These guys in, in developing the design, I mentioned they're all from, from different areas of the country, all, all out in the, the western side of the country, but they had to develop a lot of their initial idea online or by sending drawings to one another in their, their separate locations. And that works pretty well, that, that gets the communication going, but uh, then there is a lot more that needs to be communicated on the spot and in the moment, and uh, a lot of design development as they go through the process, as they see how the elements come together. So is this, uh, this gargoyle gonna represent another emotion here? Yeah? yeah? Uh, it shows red for hate. Very cool. Uh, Jose has been just cranking away here. No. Uh, James is pointing out uh, there have been lots of de design discussions and, and James and Shayla have been sort of discussing a lot of sort of core design decisions and, and Dean has gotten in on plenty of those. Jose has as well, but Jose just has been cranking along. You are, you are one productive guy. Not bad. Yep, yeah, not, not just working a lot, but quality work. The, the detail in his sculptural work is just brilliant. And a, a very singular style. I, I don't know that I've seen his work and, and not be, been able to immediately recognize it as, as his hand in the work. It's a very, very distinct, sort of aggressive style of carving and, and aggressive detail to it. Really, really unique to his hand. He's also working with a, a pretty difficult color there. To create colored glass, different metal oxides and chlorides are melted together with the ingredients for clear glass. And since they do have different ingredients in them, some different glasses will have different working characteristics to them. Uh, Viscosity is one of the biggest differences. Some color glasses are going to be really soft at the same temperature. Another one might be really stiff. Some colored glasses, if the flame isn't set just right and you're not working the glass in the right part of that flame, they may tend to boil and bubble. And uh, that red is, is a, a cadmium-based color. Those tend to boil and bubble a lot and they're really stiff, which is an awful combination. So since it's stiff, you really want to heat it a lot to get it moving. 
but if you overheat it, it starts to boil. So it's a very delicate balance of, of working the glass in the right flame setting, not overworking it, and uh, letting the heat really sort of transmit through the piece. And uh, you really, you can't rush these cadmium colors. These, these bright reds and yellows and oranges on his bench top here are all cadmium based and uh, they require very delicate handling. So it looks like Shayla's doing a little more flame polishing. We got another piece of stained glass over there. Once these get flame polished, she's also putting attachment points on. I see she's using a little bit of colored glass. And uh, we should send a, a thank you out to North Star Glass. They're one of the, the major color producers in this borosilicate market. They uh, were very nice in helping us out with uh, affordability of, of some colors and also availability of colors. So thank you to, to North Star Glass. Uh, a lot of this piece has their stargazer color in it, which is that beautiful gold, uh, gold-based purple. And also a, a shout out to Dopal's Opals. We got a, a shipment of some synthetic opals that these guys have been working into marbles. And uh, that might be something else to, to show to the camera here. I'll steal one of these guys. Just flash that here. Ah, yep. Yeah. So we've got the raw material in the bags. And an encased opal here. You can see it adds quite a bit of bling to things. A lot of, a lot of sparkle and shine and sort of that psychedelic color work in there. So yeah, adding all sorts of bells and whistles to this piece here. And the, the opals are beautiful, but they're also pretty tricky to work with. They're, they're another thing that if you're overheating them, they can start to burn up or bubble up. Uh, encasing them into the clear glass is a pretty delicate and precise process as well. Uh, to encase those, I noticed James was actually dropping them into a piece of tubing that was sealed on the bottom, and he just sort of heat the bottom of the tube, let the glass continue to melt and condense around that opal, and just take his time and sort of evacuate the air out of the tube until the, the opal is completely encased. It's a pretty delicate process for that stuff as well, so thank you, Dopal's Opals. We appreciate the help. Uh, Jose has been making these smaller gargoyles to uh, sort of be climbing onto the, the different bone arches that James is working on. So I can see how he's sort of setting things up here to be able to wrap around one of those bones. Got the, the legs set up so the bone will sort of fit right through there. Shayla doing a little bit of cleaning over there. When she goes to fire polish these stained glass windows, if there's any sort of dirt or even the, the salt from our sweat or any, any uh, oils from, from our hands on there, that could cook into the glass and, and uh, sort of scum it up a little bit. So it's important that stuff is really clean. And then she'll set it in the annealing oven, let it warm up gently. Once it's warm, she'll take it out and do that bit of fire polishing, but it is crucial that it's nice and clean before we apply a flame to that. And uh, our, our studio here, I, I love that it looks like an art studio. We, uh, oftentimes, our, our demonstration facilities here, we're, we're a museum. We want to keep everything nice and clean and, and and uh, really have everything perfect for presentation. 
That's not how most of our art studios look, though, when we're engrossed in, in our personal studios. What you tend to see is a lot of color around, a lot of parts around, tools laid out, uh, different objects in, in different states of creation. So it's nice to have that, that real true, true, to, true to form studio set up here. And also, as you see us demonstrate here at the museum, more often than not, we do a, a 15 to 20 minute demonstration. You see us make a piece from start to finish in that, that 20 minute time. But what we get to see here with these artists working on a piece throughout an entire week is what it really takes to make much more elaborate work. And, and what a, a lot of us really wind up doing in our, our personal studios. It's not easy to get a, an an audience to, to watch this sort of work for that much time. So it's, it's rare that you'll see us presenting that, but every once in a while we get a unique opportunity to, to show you this end of things and show you really in depth how some of the finest work on the planet is being made these days. So we're, we're really happy to share that with you all. Jose has all sorts of great sculpting tools here. Some are chisels for woodworking, technically. It looks like we've got some clay sculpting tools as well. Uh, he's got some great texture tools on his bench also. Graphite in all sorts of different shapes and forms. And really, as glassmakers, we'll use just about any material or any sort of implement as a tool, as long as it doesn't burn too quickly. So as long as it can hold up for a, a few touches of, of the hot glass, and if it makes sense for us to use, we're going to use it. So all sorts of different implements on the table here. And when you, when you sculpt on the, the level that Jose works on, it's crucial to have all these different tools that have different angles to them, have maybe different thicknesses of edges to them. And that allows him to get all these, these great details in. He also. Do you mind if I share your texture tool that I've been obsessing over? Let's steal that for a moment. Yeah, so this tool here has been one of my favorites that I saw Jose come in here with. This is how he gets some really brilliant texture like on the arm of the gargoyle that I was showing earlier. So he can heat the glass and, and roll this texture tool over the glass and it leaves this really fine sort of scaly texture on things. And it's really, uh, it's a drill bit. It's uh, like a hasp for, for cleaning up holes. So love to see that. He's got a, a great vision for the sort of textures and, and details that he wants in his forms. And as a sculptor, when you find that right tool that gives you what you need, you grab it and, and hang on to it. All right, so a little more analysis over here. Dean is sort of guiding how she will approach attaching the lower legs to the figure. So the, the figure at the moment has the, the head, the arms, the hands, and the thighs on there, but she hasn't attached the, the shins and the, the ankles yet. That still is yet to come. So it's important that she's going to have space to get those in as they're eyeing out how these other arches are going on here. So checking alignment, seeing what sort of space they're going to have between the different elements. And James has started to attach a couple of those marbles with the, uh, with the synthetic opals in them around the base. And I believe those bones with the gargoyles attached will get connected to those opal marbles. So just getting things adjusted so the other parts can get in there cleanly. They need to move that right arm a little bit, get it up out of the way for the next connection of, of one of those bone arches.
and using the Bunsen to keep the base of the piece warm. Shayla just using the hand torch to heat up that elbow just enough to tweak the, the position of the arm a little bit. And Jose is attaching another bridge, so using another piece of clear glass, attaching it to the tip of one of the fingers there, so he can then attach it up higher on the piece uh, where the bridge is for the head of the figure. So trying to brace these different parts into their position. If they don't bridge the hand, then if the elbow gets too hot further into the process, the forearm's gonna move and, and shift position. So bridging that in there, having it attached at another spot, it's gonna keep everything nice and steady. That'll allow them to work cleanly through the rest of the piece, and then eventually all these bridges will be removed before the, the piece is complete. So we use glass to support the glass, keep it in place, hold the details where they need to be, and then eventually you can remove that, that extraneous glass. I gotcha. Mm -hmm. So doing another check here, making sure that arm has gotten out of the way. So there is space to get this next uh, bone arch in there. I mentioned earlier we don't typically wear gloves when we blow glass, but there are moments where you do want a Kevlar glove on when things are getting heated from, from different angles. And as long as you don't have to turn the piece really accurately, uh, as, as they don't have to, as they're sort of just making these straight attachments, uh, wearing a glove is pretty helpful in moments like this. So they want to position that bone such that the bottom will attach to the opal marble. They want the top to attach from one arch to the next arch. And then a piece of the stained glass will go into that little, uh, that negative space where the arches meet. It's been really fun seeing these guys work together, hearing the communication together, hearing the, the appreciation for what each other brings to the table. And Dina was just mentioning how much she's really enjoying the, the gargoyles that Jose is making. I know Jose has been loving the, the, the touches on the, the female figure that Dina produced. So talking through our adjustments here. A lot of communication here. This is great. Do you have a question from the web? Ah, so someone online would like to learn flame working and was wondering how these guys came to learn. We're going to give them a moment and uh, get through this, this intense part here, and then we'll, we'll ask them. And I can tell you there are a number of different ways that a lot of folks learn to work glass nowadays. Uh, it seems like most folks who are new to glass that are learning nowadays do tend to go to colleges and universities. So there are a lot of four-year art school programs that have glass as part of their curriculum. But it is not typical to have flame working as a major part of that curriculum. Uh, flame working is catching on more and more in university programs. But uh, a lot more flame workers tend to tend to learn more either in workshops or by uh, working with other established artists. So we'll ask these guys their paths once, uh, once they have a moment to actually be interrupted. We have a wonderful 
place to learn glass working here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We have a fabulous teaching facility, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass, and we bring artists in from all around the world to teach their specialties here at the museum. So that's a, a great way to learn also. If you go on our website, cmog.org, uh, you will see uh, a button to link to glass making, and that will give you another button that will take you to studio class offerings. We offer classes on all levels, complete beginner to really advanced. Jose, actually, I, I first got to meet him this past summer. He was here as a teaching assistant for another very talented artist, Dan Coyle. This is great. Good communication. Everybody sort of coming to consensus here, getting the parts in the right spot, getting that arm right where it needs to be, getting it bridged in there. All right, we'll get her back in the oven. That all sealed up. And everybody take a breath and jazz clap. There we go. Nice. The, the teamwork is fantastic. I, I love the teamwork and the communication. Like you said, there's no way to rush this. If we try to rush it, we'll break it. We'll lose hours or tens or hundreds of hours of work. And so it's like every step reveals to us what the next step can be or should be. So some of it is a bunch of planning on our part, and then some of it is us listening to the piece and, and knowing what needs to happen the next step to, to get to the end of the finish line. Yeah, if you, if you couldn't quite hear James online, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, what he's pointing out is that the piece itself is helping to direct a lot of the action. They, as they add a part, they have to analyze the piece, see, see what the piece tells them needs to go next and how that needs to fit in there. So uh, a lot of development on the fly. And uh, again, nothing can be rushed. If, if they try to rush this piece, things get, get catastrophic pretty quickly. So got to make sure everybody's ready for these moves as the piece comes out of the kiln. Make sure they've communicated before it comes out of the oven exactly what the moves are going to be, who's going to make them, where they're going to be positioned. And uh, yeah, you've got to really listen to the piece as it directs them what can happen next. like Dina's got one of the legs over there. So I mentioned she still has the, the calves and feet to attach onto her figures. And she's doing a little editing, trimming it down, getting it to just the right size. Now that she can see how the, the other parts of the piece are coming together, she can make a, a slight adjustment to the, the length of the leg and exactly where the, the knee is going to connect. So doing a little bit of editing on the fly here, which is typical. Oh, and she's going to decorate it too. Excellent. I mentioned how Dina had added uh, a lot of sort of floral forms going on the figure, almost like tattoos around the figure. And I see she's drawing some of, some of this work onto the leg as well. So the, the leg is a combination of a couple different green colored glasses that have been layered over each other and she's using a, another shade of green on top of that to draw in some vines and then I, I suspect she'll add some, some flowers onto those vines as well. Really sort of bringing in the, the, the theme of nature into everything here. Shayla getting this piece of stained glass prepped, doing some fire polishing. She's added attachment points to either side of the window, so it's, it'll be prepared to attach to the, the arches, the bone arches that are being prepared. We really want to get that all cleaned up, get all the, 
uh, any uh, bits of rough surface melted and smoothed in. When glass has an abraded surface, it is very sensitive to cracking. If you think of the abrasions as the beginnings of cracks themselves, uh, it really just takes a little more shock, a little bit more of a, an extreme temperature change, and those cracks just want to expand and, and propagate, and the whole thing can, can start popping. So it is crucial that uh, everything is polished. We, we don't want to leave any of those little indentations, the, the little, uh, little abrasions on there. And also by removing the abrasions, we get a nice shiny surface. <laughs> we appreciate these guys uh, being willing to, to make the effort to come here to Corning and then being willing to work in front of our public audiences and then even further being willing to, to go on a live stream and a recording. That is not how most artists typically work. And it, uh, until you get used to it, it can be a very different feeling. It's also tricky working in other people's studios. Uh, in our own studios, we know exactly what tools we have. We know exactly where they are. And you're very comfortable. Your studio sort of develops as your work develops over time. And then to come into a completely foreign place and uh, be able to make the same level of work takes some adjusting and, and some adaptation and uh, takes the, the ability to sort of let go and, and accept the, the conditions that you're working in and figure out how to make them work best for you. Do we have another question from the web here? Uh, what type of percolator is in there? What, what do we have for the perk in there? A two-hole perk. Can I say two-hole diffy for the, the audience out in California that really wants to hear me say two-hole diffy? Yeah. If they're, if they're watching out at peace of mind, I'm, I'm sure they're teeing me up to say two-hole diffy. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I mentioned this is the third year that we've done this sort of a, a collaborative flameworking program here at the museum. And in our first year, we had three fabulous artists. Uh, Dan Coyle goes by Coyle Condenser. Uh, we had Adam Hubri goes by Hoob's Glass. And Ryan O'Keefe, who goes by uh, SD Rhino. And uh, yeah, we, we had the same question. and. I've mentioned this, a lot of this technology and a lot of the terminology is pretty new to me and I know everybody enjoyed when uh, they asked what sort of perk. Apparently, Rhino always puts a two-hole diffy in his work and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's nice, nice to learn this stuff. Trying to keep up to speed with a, a very fast-moving facet of the glass world. And uh, flame working really is, is going through such an acceleration these days and, and really has been over the last, oh, probably 15 to 20 years, but particularly over the last decade, we, we see tons of people getting into this, this craft. And uh, especially this, this pipe making movement has really opened up flame working and, and glass making to a, a whole new realm of, of folks who may never have really considered art as a, a possibility for, for career. And flame working, since it is so convenient and, and affordable to set up, uh, it has made a, a career path accessible for a lot of folks who probably otherwise would not have worked in the arts, probably not, would not have worked in glass. And uh, there is a really powerful community of, of flame workers out there. There are thousands of folks that are in their garages and basements and their sheds out in their yards who are, are making a living making glass on their own terms. And uh, it's, it's fun to see. It's quite a, a unique movement, I think, in art and, and certainly in glass. Where are the windows intended to be mounted? We've got these arch forms that are coming together. So there is one big window that is going to go into that center arch, 
which is this guy here. And we'll maybe sneak that in on Jose's camera, if we can get that up there. So there's our big central window. And you may notice when they pull the, the piece out, there is also a circular piece of hollow stained glass up top. So that'll sort of set above this pair of arches in that main central arch. And then I've been mentioning these other bone arches that, that uh, James has been working on. Those, once they get attached, the other windows will be applied in that negative space as well. So we did have a question a little while ago about where you guys all learned your craft. So Jose, where did, where did you learn? I used to work in a company that used to do distribution of uh, glass, and then they brought a couple glass blowers, and then I feel so attracted to it. <laughs> and then I asked if I could uh, try it, the sign thing, I love it. Yeah, he, Jose worked for a company, and this is in Southern California too, that uh, was a production, sculptural, flameworking fact. That was uh, more like a production, just uh, straight pipes and stuff. Ah, okay, it was a, a production pipe shop. Yeah, and he, so he got his beginnings in a, a production shop, fell in love with this stuff, and uh, as you can see, has really taken to it and sort of taken off on his own style and, uh, and just really sort of powered his way along. So he learned in sort of a, a factory setting, a production setting. And James, where did you get your start? Uh, I started in my dad's garage in Albuquerque, New Mexico after school every day and spent about a year developing bad habits and just it all wrong. <laughs> so James... <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they, in, within a month, they untaught everything I had learned bad and taught me how to do it. Nice. So James got started on his own in, uh, in his dad's garage in Albuquerque. And as he just pointed out, he learned all the bad habits right off the bat. And then uh, moved to Colorado and worked for Diablo Glass there. And they cleaned up his bad habits, got him on the right path. And uh, here we are, what, 20 plus years later, and, and off we go. Yeah. And Shayla, how did you learn this craft? I got started in uh, my mom's head shop in Pueblo, Colorado. Mm -hmm. All right, so Shayla's mom owned a, a head shop in Pueblo, Colorado, and she learned there, making production work there. So, yeah, production is a, a good way to get started in glass. It's hard to get good at this stuff. It requires a lot of repetition, a lot of practice. So if you can get a job or, or create your own job making production work where you're repeating process over and over, that is a great way to, to learn and really excel quickly with this stuff. And Dina, how did you get started flame working? I know you started with a, a formal art background. You went to Alba Alberta College of Art and Design. Or, or you didn't, that's right, you didn't go there, but you were exploring going there. I fell in love with the glass blowing department. Oh, that's right. Back to Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And through meeting uh, a, a few different individuals, I actually ended up at Diablo Glass also. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... <laughs> nice. Yeah, so Dina was, was exploring art school, sorry, exploring uh, art school at Alberta College of Art and Design up in, in uh, Calgary, Alberta. And uh, you, you were thinking of painting as a direction for yourself, right? And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, she'd been granted an international student scholarship and upon visiting the school, made the mistake a lot of folks in the arts have made, which is stumbling into the glass studio. And uh, yeah, getting seduced by glass. And she also wound up working for Diablo back in, in Colorado and, and learned a lot of her technique and, and developed quite a bit there. And you've been working as an independent artist for a long time since then too. 
Yeah, she wouldn't change a minute of it. This, uh, the glass thing gets very seductive and then very addictive. Uh, as you get into working with this material, it is a, a really powerful magnet. It's hard to get away from it. You make a few things, you enjoy making those few things, but as you're making those, you realize there are a dozen other things you could potentially make in a similar fashion, or maybe make a few tweaks to your process and you're coming up with entirely new objects. So it gets really addictive. Another question from the web, what do we got? How tall will the piece stand? Uh, it is pretty close to its finished height. Uh, the next element that will add a little more height to it is the gargoyle that's going to go on top, which will be one of the last moves. So it's going to be probably around 14 to 16 inches tall. And uh, it will probably wind up, I'm guessing, close to 10 inches wide and, and deep as well. Pretty substantial piece to have this much detail added to it. All right, I see James getting the glove back on. That means so there's an, uh, another big move about to come up. Excellent. All right, so the next move here. Uh, Jose had made a couple of gargoyle heads, just the heads themselves. They're going to attach these onto the base. And you notice before these may, they make these moves, they've been splashing some heat onto the graphite there. Uh, right on the table out back. Yep. So we we want the graphite to be warm. Graphite is a, a pretty serious heat sink. It will draw heat from the glass pretty quickly. Uh, it holds the heat there pretty well, but we do not want that piece to get the heat sucked out of it too quickly. So warming the graphite is a good prep step to, to make sure we don't have that, uh, that level of shock occur, occur. So a little more communication there. Shayla and James are just going through exactly the steps in the process they're going to go through as that piece comes out of the oven. They want to be ready and, and know exactly what's going to happen, who's going to make that move, when and where, before the piece comes out of the oven where it's, it's suddenly at risk. This is the calm before the storm here. Ah, the gloves. <laughs> yeah, so these yellow gloves are, are made with Kevlar fibers. Help to protect you from the heat. So you guys are getting a good view from overhead. You can see uh, James has some different angles drawn on this piece of concrete board here. So that'll give them a, a good sort of geometric reference as to where they want to attach the different bits. Calm before the storm. Make sure every step's worked out. <laughs> Crucial discussion here. <laughs> If those, those heads get attached on the wrong spots, then we don't have the right space for the rest of that leg to come down in the right position. So we've got everything, uh, everything's got to be lined up and decided properly. Once we start attaching things to that base, removing them gets pretty sketchy. Well, uh, we might affect the color, we might affect the form if they have to start pulling bits off of there. So 
crucial to make the decisions before the, the hot piece uh, gets any more work done to it. Getting our hand torches ready. And James is getting that Bunsen ready. Getting it all aligned here. Alrighty. Here we go. So we'll just soak her with some of that Bunsen heat. Let it penetrate a little bit. Take a look at how that lower leg is going to be attached and what space that needs to attach into, and then where those heads can go around that. Checking alignments here. And Shayla's preparing one of those heads, getting it nice and clean. The, the kilns that we have, the, the bricks on the inside, the insulative bricks are very soft, so they do tend to leave a little bit of dust on the glass. It's important to get that brushed off of there, otherwise you start actually cooking that dust into the glass. Not ideal. <clears throat> so they've marked exactly where that leg needs to come down. So now they have a good idea where they can put these other heads in there without uh, blocking the space where the leg needs to come down. helpful to have those lines drawn on that board there so they're able to judge exactly where those attachments need to be and have it marked up on the, the, the concrete board. All right, so let that soak for a little longer. <clears throat> I hear some discussion about adding material for attachment points, so adding additional material uh, to the, the heads that then will be attached to the base of the piece. Uh, if they just try attaching the head directly to the piece, some of the head gets distorted, so it's helpful to have an extra little bit of material there between the two objects. Trying to make sure everything stays nice and clean through the rest of the process. A lot to be figured out. These, these next few moves will help to direct a lot of where the, the rest of the piece gets laid out. So it is, it is crucial that they're all in agreement and they've got a, a good solid plan established here. Excited to see how this piece continues to unfold. I've, uh, I feel like I have a decent vision of, of what it's gonna turn into, but you never really know until all those different elements come together. And uh, for those of you watching the, the live stream, again, we'll, we'll put up a recording of the live stream in uh, about a week and a half or so. And on that recording, we will add in some images and a little bit of video of the finished piece. So be sure to tune back into our YouTube channel, give it maybe a week and a half, two weeks, and, and we'll have that video up there. You can see the finished piece. And of course, keep an eye on the, the Corning Museum of Glass Instagram as well. We'll continue to share more and more of this process as these guys finish out over the next day and a half. Keep an eye on their individual Instagram pages as well. Windstar Glass, Hick Dog, Soulfire Glass, Cyan Glass.
So are we removing the head from that foot? Is that what's going on there? Ah. <laughs> so you see these guys adjusting their flames a lot. We have different sort of colors and, and shapes of flames going on here. When the flame looks a little more yellowy orangey, uh, like the, the flame on Shayla's torch right now, or, or what Jose is using. We get that yellowish orange flame when we remove more of the oxygen from the flame, which means they've dropped the temperature. The uh, oxygen is the accelerant that's raising the temperature of the, the flame, allows more of that gas to, to fully combust. So these yellow flames, they're using to warm the glass, but not really melt it been talking about maintaining temperature, how important it is not to change temperatures too severely. So those, those big bushy yellowy flames are an opportunity to gently warm the glass, not hit it with such extreme heat that it could shock it. Got another question from the web over here? What do we got? Uh, is the rig made for flour or concentrate? Both. Okay. James says leans towards being better for concentrate, but will work for both. So we're very excited for our winter collective event tonight, too. I'm excited to see a whole bunch of these guys' work laid out. And uh, excited for some collectors to have the opportunity to scoop up some of their work. I know our retail team had started laying some of the work out earlier this week and it started selling immediately. So they actually pulled it off of the shelves because we wanted to make sure to, to have plenty of inventory for the event tonight. So that's a, that's a good start. We like that. Shayla's doing my more fire polishing here. I can sort of see the, the surface changing, the optics changing. What was sort of fuzzy and a, a little bit blurry is getting shinier and more distinct, also getting a little more transparent by uh, sort of smoothing in that surface, getting it polished. like Dina's refining the, the foot on this other leg, getting it positioned exactly the way she needs it so it makes sense once it gets attached to the rest of the piece there. That foot is at the, the proper angle to relate to the rest of the leg and how the, the figure is, is positioned and postured. So I mentioned Shayla had done some cold working to uh, these windows. We had gone through that microwave process, that popcorning, and uh, that does leave a, a bit of a rough surface on there. So to polish glass, uh, we will typically use lapidary wheels. So uh, horizontal wheels that spin, that have different abrasives that will carve away some of the glass and we go through finer and finer grits of abrasives and uh, I believe she got to a, a 360 grit before taking it to this point and being confident that she could just polish it the rest of the, the way with the flame. If you haven't mechanically polished the glass enough and it has too, uh, too rough of a, a texture to it, if you take the torch to it, it tends to bubble and it gets fuzzier rather than getting more polished. So it is important to uh, cold work it and grind it down to a certain level of finish before you, you try to use the flame to get it the rest of the way polished. 
another trick as she's doing this polishing, she really only wants to soften the very surface of that glass. So she's being very cautious with waving that little flame around there, just letting things flow just enough on the surface to, to get a polish, but not softening enough to change shape at all. Uh, another possibility as she's heating with that torch is uh, there is a, a pinkish color in there that could actually change a little bit if uh, she gets it too hot. So we're at one of those moments again where we're waiting for the the piece to soak enough heat in before we take it back out of the oven to make attachments. So these guys are cranking away on the, the different elements that they'll be adding throughout the, the course of the rest of the process here. And James is working on another one of those smaller bone sections. adding a, a little extra material on the, the end there that you can use to get this attached to the, the body of the vessel. See different size torches, all sorts of different heat sources around the studio here. So they've got their bench torches, which are the ones that are really mounted right to the bench. That's what they use for the majority of the work they do. And we've seen a, a couple different hand torches, like what Shayla has in her hand at the moment. Uh, having the torch in your hand and being able to move that around the object can be really helpful. And those provide some really f small flames that we can get into some very tough angles. Uh, very hard to just maneuver a big piece around the torch. Much easier to set that piece down and use the torch around the, the piece itself instead of having to risk the piece moving around. So having these different torches is crucial. We've seen the use of the Bunsen burner, how important that is. The oven's absolutely crucial. The microwave oven being really important for this process too. That was, that was a new one. Thank goodness for secondhand stores in this area. Uh, typically when we get an oven for a glass shop, we're talking thousands of dollars. It was nice to get one for 30 bucks. I see James putting some marks on the, the concrete board over here, making sure everything's going to be aligned properly. And are you working on the head for the, that red gargoyle? Mm-hmm. Nice, a good opportunity to see Jose work his way through an entire one of these heads. And uh, he does a, a really nice job of, of sort of blocking out rough detail and just slowly honing in those finer and finer details through his process here. It's been a, a real pleasure to sort of watch how, he, how these, these figures develop and, and evolve in his, his order of process. So just sort of starting with the rough form and then refining and refining and refining. I've <laughs> been really appreciating the, the equipment that James has too. There's a foot pedal attached to that Bunsen burner. So when he wants to fire it up, he just clicks the pedal that starts the flow of gas and just hitting the gas with the, the torch gets it lit. Really convenient. As you can see, his hands are more than occupied. So being able to, to have a foot pedal to control things, very helpful. And if you're curious about those foot pedals to uh, control a Bunsen burner. He worked out his design with uh, a company called Mad Hatter. And there, those uh, foot pedals are available through those folks. We got a little bit of surgery going on here. 
So just adjusting where the, the knee joint will be. Getting ready to attach the lower leg onto that left leg. So just trying to set up the, the angle of the knee and the end of the thigh just right so the, the lower leg comes off at the, the right direction. So ultimately the, the, the lower leg they're going to want to have attached of course at the knee but they'll also want it attached to the base so it's connected in two different spots. So we want to set up the, the end of the thigh there so it's just right. So sort of trimming some of the material off and, and out of the way there to get that angle just right. I love the communication here. It's the, the respect and trust to, to ask for a little advice when you're in an inten intense moment and have that extra set of eyes that you really trust. can be tricky when you're really engrossed in a project to, to see the full scope of the entire piece. Your, your attention tends to get locked in on what that next move is going to be. So it helps to have extra eyes around the piece looking at the, the whole scope of, of what's going on. So Shayla's been preparing the, the top of the calf, getting the angle just right. So this attachment will be nice and clean. The angles are set up properly. The, the foot's going to hang at the right angle. So here we go. So eyeing out exactly how those angles come together. And it sounds like we need a little more adjusting here. to sneak a picture or two in here as well. All right, so a little bit of adjusting, figuring out exactly how things are going to be aligned. Let's let that piece soak a little more heat in there. Everybody can relax for a moment. Shayla's going to get the top of the calf set up just at the right angle. We don't want more material involved than, than what will be necessary. So we want that, that calf sort of trimmed up just right. So as they come together, it's going to be the proper angle. It's going to look natural. All right, so we'll let the piece soak for a few more minutes. Everybody can relax a little bit for a moment. We got another question from the web here. What have we got? A refresher on what we're making. We are making a water pipe in the form of a cathedral with that female figure in the center of the cathedral. The, the function of the water pipe comes from that base the, the sort of purple and bluish base, the can, it flows up through the figure, flows out through her, or the, the water will flow out through her elbow, and uh, smoke will come up the arch as water flows down the arch. And uh, yeah, there will be a gargoyle on top that will hold the mouthpiece as well. So yeah, it's a cathedral that is going to function as a, as a water pipe with a whole lot of decoration and, uh, and, and theme involved as well. I've mentioned the, the elements of the faux stained glass that are going to go in to really give it that cathedral vibe. We've got all these gargoyles that really sort of direct us toward that, that gothic theme of a cathedral. 
Athena's beautiful female figure interacting with those gargoyles. Several of them represent different emotions. Yes, sir. Interesting point. James is mentioning that uh, the female form, her energy is sort of driving away these powerful emotions. So it's not that the, the gargoyles are, are attacking her with these emotions, but she is empowered and, and sort of controlling these emotions. Love it. It's unfortunately tough to see the, the facial expressions on, on some of uh, Jose's emotion-themed gargoyles, but the, the finished piece, we'll make sure we get plenty of close shots of those and uh, give, you, give you a good look. He really has, has put quite a bit of thought into exactly how each of these faces are, are represented. Oh, and look at you, Dina, working on a, a skull here. Well, she makes a, a lot of the, the female forms, both in solid and hollow forms. Over the, the last few years, she's been making a lot of skulls and skeletons as well. And Dina won a, a pretty prestigious competition last year, the, the World Series of Glass solo competition at the, the Glass Vegas trade show <clears throat> with a, a beautiful compositional piece that had one of her skeletons as sort of the, the centerpiece to that. A well-deserved win. Beautiful piece. And uh, James and Shayla have also won their share of competitions. There are a lot of events in the flameworking industry that involve a, a component of competition that are, are typically timed competitions where you're making glass at the trade show on the spot. Very difficult thing to do. And uh, also a lot of these events will have competitions where you may bring a pre-made piece and, and display it and, and have... Uh, official judges and also uh, have a lot of the, the audience at the trade shows vote on these different pieces. So it's quite prestigious to have the rest of the industry voting on your work as a, a winner uh, amongst many, many super talented artists. So more discussion of what the next steps are going to be. Got some facial details coming together on this next uh, gargoyle head here. Jose has very accurate hands as well. Definitely have noticed that. To, to be able to make such finely detailed, small-scale sculpture takes very accurate hands and uh, a very deft touch as well. As, as we sort of carve into molten glass, the, the first step of carving is sort of feeling how soft the glass is. We judge how soft it is a bit visually just by looking at the glow of the glass, but then you really have to respond to that touch as you're pressing in how much is that knife or that edge of a piece of graphite actually driving into the glass. So you're sort of constantly responding to what the glass is doing. Looks like we're getting the, all the right colors together for this next move as well. This should be perfect. <laughs> Hi, Internet. <laughs> Hi, Internet. <laughs> These skulls are great. Dina has a few pendants on her bench top here that have skulls as the centerpiece with different seasonal elements around them. Really beautiful work. A 
have a, a few friends and colleagues around the industry that are always very active at different flameworking community events, and I, I tend to ask them, you know, who should who should I be looking at from the, the Corning Museum of Glass perspective? Who should we be looking at for guest artist possibilities? Maybe uh, folks who might uh, be be good to bring in as instructors. And uh, a buddy of mine that I count on for good advice all the time in the, the flameworking scene, Hugh Salkine, mentioned Dina to me a few years ago. So I've been sort of keeping an eye out. I'd seen her work years prior to that and uh, it definitely caught my attention. But when, when Hugh mentioned quite specifically, keep an eye out, she's, uh, as Shayla mentioned the other day, she's a, a glassblower's glassblower. She uh, is a brilliant sculptor, super talented, and she's not one of those folks that is constantly posting online. She's sort of quiet and a little too humble about her work. So sometimes people like that, we have to pull you out of your, your environment and get you here so we can get you out there to the rest of the world where you belong. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Shayla's getting attachment points onto the edges of uh, another piece of the stained glass here. It's really helpful to add little bits of extra material as these attachment points. I mentioned a little earlier how Jose was adding extra material to one of the, the gargoyle heads. So when we go to attach the, the head to the rest of the piece, the head doesn't distort. We just melt that little bit of extra material. So also very helpful. We want all these details to stay nice and clean on the stained glass. It's much easier just to add a little touch of extra glass to the side than it is to try to attach right to that side and keep it clean with attaching directly to the rest of the piece. So a very smart move there. We've got that extra little buffer. She'll be able to make a nice clean attachment but not distort any of the image. So for those of you in-house here, while the, the live stream is going to end at 4 o'clock, which is a little less than 10 minutes away, these guys are going to continue working uh, right up until 5.30, uh, until we, we head out of this space and into the re retail space for the Winter Collective, our, our gallery uh, presentation here. So if you want to continue watching some of the, the, the action here, please, by all means, stick around. Looks like we're getting ready for one more big move for our, our live stream audience before we let you guys go. All right, getting, getting everybody's rolls. All worked out here before the piece comes out of the oven. That is one awesome looking hand torch right there too. So we've got the, the rest of that leg pulled out of the oven. We'll get that nice and warm. Make sure plenty of heat is soaked in there. And we'll get one more, one more big move made here. And 
again, using the Bunsen to soak a little more, little more heat than what the oven provides in there. Get it to penetrate a little bit more. Give them a little more leeway on working time. So James getting the, the thigh area up to the right temperature for the attachment. Jose getting the, the top of that calf at the right temperature. And we'll bring those together, get them attached. They'll attach at the knee and then they want to attach to the, the base as well. All right, here we go. So checking alignment first. We need a little more heat to really get those fused properly. Laying that right across there. Jose is sort of keeping that knee area soft so James can bend it down, get it aligned for the attachment to the back of the, the heel, get it attached to the base, get her really well secured in there. So removing that handle, the, the punty rod. Get this onto the platform here so they can get a little more aggressive with things, get it out of James' hands. A lot of communication going on here. They're discussing how to rotate the piece, when they're going to rotate it, who's applying the, the flame where. Jose say something about getting the leg a little bit higher. So it looks like they're, they're softening the lower attachment point and the upper one. Shayla's got some forceps. She's going to slide that up a little bit. Get it in just the position they want. So they're cooling down the, the knee attachment. Shayla just shut the gas on her torch off and is just running the oxygen just to cool that glass, get it to firm up very quickly. And just refining the, the connections. We want everything nice and uniform. We don't want to leave sharp, acute angles where the parts come together. The glass will pull apart if we leave a sharp, acute angle there. As it cools, it'll pull that angle apart. So they're making sure everything's really fused in, smoothed in. So James just got his blow hose attached back to the, the bottom tube supporting the piece so he can blow in a little bit, inflate the glass. As they're heating around the, the hollow form, the hollow wants to cave in a little bit, so a little bit of air pressure keeps that from caving in. So gravity is a really important force when you're working with molten glass. Notice he's got the piece upside down here. They want some of that glass that they're melting in that connection area to fall, uh, move a little more towards the, the top of the piece, so using gravity. Gravity is going to affect what you're doing anyways. You better learn to use it to your advantage. A little puff of air to 
make sure it doesn't indent and, and collapse in. It's all fused in here. Really good communication amongst our, our team members. trying to clean up that knee connection, get everything nice and clean and uniform. Again, make sure all uh, acute angles are, are worked out, that everything's flowed together well. Getting that blow hose attached in there so James can inflate it, blow that glass out a little bit, get that wall thickness uniform. cautious with the placement of those the torch flames the, the Bunsen flame is cool enough that it's not going to have too many negative effects but if those torch flames that are 4,000 degrees hit an area that's a little too cold then we run into some serious problems tough to see, but the, the foot is on top of a gargoyle head. Oh, this is great. Jose is actually directing James when to blow a little bit of air in there. But typically, that's something that we do ourselves. You're blowing and shaping yourself. Not, not easy to uh, coordinate having somebody else do the blowing as you're doing the very delicate shaping. So now that they've got everything fused well, Jose is just touching up the, the sculpting and in, in making the attachment, we lose some of the angles and the sort of the, the muscle tone, things like that. So he's, now that it's fused well, he's reheating different areas and sort of carving in to really refine that joint where the, the knee is, is coming together there. Pull the knee to a little more of a point. So Shayla's sort of softening up the, the tip of it a little bit. Jose is going to pull on that. Stretch it, get really get a nice knee detail in there. mentioned how we use all sorts of different materials and different Im implements as tools when we work with glass and simple butter knife, pretty handy stuff.
uh, getting things at the right angle so the glass is going to flow the right direction as they're softening it. Crucial. All righty. These guys are happy with that attachment. We're going to go back into the oven, let the piece soak back up to temperature before the next big move. But uh, here we are. It is a little after 4 o'clock. Another <laughs> jazz clap there. Awesome. So for our live stream audience, we are going to sign off here. So we'll give another nice round of applause for James Hickdog Lynch, Dina Soulfire Glass Kalahar, Shayla Windstar Glass Berman, and Jose Cyan Glass Sanchez. A great job from our team. We've got a ways to go yet, so check back in on our, our YouTube channel in about a week and a half to two weeks for that final recording, and we'll have images and, and video of the finished piece. But thank you all for tuning in. Thank you guys for, for joining us in person here. And uh, we'll see you on the next live stream from the Corning Museum of Glass. Thank you. <laughs>